Unit 14. Trends in Society. 14.1. Exercise 9. OK, let's continue our discussion of changes in society. Can you explain why the birth rate is falling in many countries? Well, of course I'm not an expert, but there are probably several reasons for this decline. Often both people in a relationship are working, so it's hard for them to bring up large families. They are choosing not to, in other words. Also, I read somewhere that there may be an environmental issue, that pollution is causing couples to be less fertile. I think that's a real possibility. And what impact does an ageing population have on society? It has many implications. First, older people usually need more support. I don't just mean health care, but also social support, you know, like um, entertainment to give them a better quality of uh, life to stop them feeling lonely. Secondly, because there are fewer younger people working and paying taxes, it means that there is a question mark over resources. How much? The state can provide. Do you think the state should provide completely free care for the elderly? Yes, I do, in theory. But as I said earlier, in practice, there may be not enough money to do that. People are going to have to save for their old age, I guess. And in the future, will working people have to retire at a later age than they currently do? Um, I suppose so, yes. Actually, I don't think there is anything wrong with that. I mean, if you want to go on working, you're healthy, and your brain is still sharp, you have a lot to offer, all that experience and knowledge. And more generally, what can young people learn from their grandparents and great-grandparents? Oh, many, many things. Sometimes we complain that old people don't understand us. But they have seen a lot, experienced many different things. So they can give us advice on life. And speaking personally, my grandmother is a really good listener too. I talk to her about many things I wouldn't ever discuss with my parents. Why are people generally living longer nowadays, in your opinion? It must be down to health care, good hospitals, and a better diet as well. That's crucial, you know what you eat. Thank you. 14.2. Exercise 2. Questions 1 to 5. In this course, we'll be looking at some of the causes of social change around the world, and we'll have one or two examples of each. In this brief introduction, though, I'll use the UK to illustrate some of the great variety of changes that occur. Social change may come about as a result of physical conditions, such as drought, flooding or crop failure. The Irish potato famine of the 1840s led vast numbers of individuals and whole families to emigrate from rural areas of Ireland to cities, particularly in Britain and the USA. As is usually the case, those who went away were the most active and ambitious, and by losing those people, many rural Irish communities subsequently stagnated. Immigrants usually make a massive contribution to the culture of the receiving country, and Britain has benefited a great deal from this over the centuries. Some groups, like the French Protestants of the 17th century, have become assimilated into the dominant culture. It's too early to predict the long-term effects of some recent waves of immigration to Britain, although newcomers from some parts of Asia, particularly China, Vietnam, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, have had a remarkable impact on national eating habits in the UK. Contact with other communities doesn't only come about through immigration. As a result of the massive increase in air travel in recent years, many people have adopted customs that they first encountered abroad, such as drinking wine or sitting in pavement cafes. 
This reflects a change from previous generations, who knew little of behaviour outside their immediate neighbourhood, let alone in other countries. Political factors can lead to considerable social change, and probably the most significant for Britain was the First World War of 1914 to 18. This did a great deal to allow women to catch up with men in terms of political power, job opportunities and individual freedom. Questions 6 to 10 Britain has had a fair degree of political stability for several hundred years. As a result, political factors have played a relatively minor role in social change, compared with many other countries, and economic factors have been far more important. I now want to look briefly at how economic factors influenced one major change, the movement of millions of people from the countryside into urban areas during the late 18th century and throughout the 19th. New methods of production meant that, for the first time, most items were manufactured in big factories, instead of in people's homes, and these required a large number of workers living nearby. Remember, there was little public transport and no cars. However, the massive expansion of cities in the 19th century brought with it many problems, including poor health, road congestion and substandard housing. Just to give you an idea of how one change can lead to a succession of others, the need for a better educated workforce resulted in education becoming compulsory in the late 19th century. This was a factor in weakening the ties of extended families and the wider community and establishing the nuclear family, that is, one consisting of husband, wife and children, as the main operating unit of society. And, as a consequence, the roles of husband and wife changed quite significantly. At the beginning of the 19th century, only a quarter of the population of Britain lived in urban areas. By the 1970s, that figure had become three quarters. Since then, though, the flow into towns has to some extent been reversed, with many people moving from urban to rural areas. Unlike traditional village dwellers, though, a lot of the new residents work in towns, and almost all of them depend on towns for their shopping, education and entertainment. This has obviously had an impact on social structure and life in villages, which I'll come back to later. Although towns have often been blamed for having an alienating effect on their residents, this certainly isn't always the case. Most big towns contain urban villages, that is, small areas with a settled community linked in a network of relationships. Many urban villages used to exist in areas of poor housing and were destroyed by slum clearance programmes in which people were moved to new housing estates at a distance. But now there's evidence of urban villages in both poor and more affluent areas. Now let's turn to the... Unit 15. Risk and Reality. 15.1. Exercises 5 and 6 1. Is it time to go? Yes. 2. Excuse me? Yes. 3. Did you enjoy the film? Yes. 4. Would you like some chocolate? Yes. Five. Could you spare me a few minutes, please? Yes. 15.1. Exercise 7. Could you describe any risks that you take in your hobbies? Yes. I've got a passion for potholing, which means climbing down into underground caves and trying to make your way through them. There's always a risk of losing your balance and falling, or even of getting lost.
if you explore a cave system that you're not familiar with. Could you describe any risks that you take in your hobbies? Yes. I've got a passion for potholing, which means climbing down into underground caves and trying to make your way through them. There's always a risk of losing your balance and falling, or even of getting lost if you explore a cave system that you're not familiar with. 15.2 Exercise 2 OK, thank you all for your suggestions for the study days on philosophy at the end of the month. These are the ones I've chosen for the six sessions. We'll tackle three topics on each day. On the first day, which is a Thursday, we'll start with language and the question of whether speakers of different languages see the world in different ways. I'll spend the first half hour giving you an overview of the main theories and then we'll divide into discussion groups. Next, there'll be time for you to consider the law. Uh, to be more specific, the question, is it ever right to break the law? For this, could you form yourselves into teams of four or five? I'll give each team a different case study. Then you can go off anywhere you like for an hour to discuss the case without any interference from me. I'd like you to plan a short presentation on it, which you'll give when we all come together afterwards. Also for Thursday, I've chosen political ideologies, considered from a philosophical point of view. Professor Robertson has agreed to produce a handout summarising his views, which I'd like you to read in advance so we'll have a starting point for discussion. Several of you were interested in the application of philosophy to medicine, so on Friday we'll begin with a session on what it means when doctors say they know the cause of an illness. Susan Harris of the School of Medicine will put forward her views on this and after she's finished she'll give you a handout of questions to discuss in small groups. Then we'll go on to the question, what is time? Barry Clark, one of our PhD students, will give an introduction to this rather heavyweight subject. He'll have to leave immediately afterwards so we won't have any discussion or questions until after he's gone when I'll take over from Barry. And we'll end on a perhaps slightly lighter note with a look at the philosophy of coincidence. No lecture for this. You'll need to think in advance about what coincidences are. And I'll begin the discussion by asking some of you to put forward your ideas. I'll give you a couple of references so you can read up on the topic beforehand. 15.2 Exercise 5 OK, now we've been considering some of the factors that affect how we understand and interpret the world around us. And today we're going to look at coincidences. Could someone come up with a definition? It's when two or more similar things happen at around the same time and seem to be connected, but there isn't any obvious explanation. And people think it's surprising or significant. OK, that'll do to start. Let's have a few examples. There's the birthday coincidence. Uh huh. Well, if you have a class of 20 or 30 children, people are amazed if two of them have the same birthday. And how significant is it if that happens? Not at all, because with only 23 children, there's a one in two chance that any two of them will share a birthday. Most people think you need a far larger number of children. Of course, it's far less likely that two particular children will have the same birthday, or that any two will share a particular birthday. Right. Another example? What about people who correctly predict the result of a football match for five consecutive weeks to try to persuade you to buy the computer programme they claim to be using? That's impressive. And their predictions are correct. They certainly are. Ah, uh, then they've probably also sent out other predictions which were wrong. Exactly. <laughs> They start by writing to a number of people and divide them into three groups. They tell one group that one team will win, tell another group that the other team will win, and tell the third group that the result will be a draw. The second week, they only write to the people who'd received the correct prediction and again divide them into three groups, and so on, for five weeks. The people who receive all five correct forecasts are very impressed, of course, but they don't know that for every person who gets five correct predictions, 242 don't. It seems very impressive when you only know part of what's happened. Mm. 
Then there are the apparent coincidences in fortune telling or astrology. Go on. Well, astrologers describe someone's personality when they don't know the person, only the pattern of stars when they were born. Lots of people believe them, but they generally forget about the statements that aren't true, and only remember the ones that are. So in this case, people are selecting evidence and seeing a pattern which doesn't exist. Yes, which we often do. And sometimes people may miss a pattern that really does exist. Um, for instance, the higher the number of ice creams that are sold, the more attacks there are by sharks on people swimming in the sea. It's not that sharks get more dangerous because people are eating ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> the reason is that a rise in hot weather has led to both. Yes. Then there's the interesting case of a woman who won an American lottery twice within four months. <laughs> Gosh. Lucky woman. <laughs> How likely do you think that is? Uh, must be one chance in millions. According to some of the early newspaper reports, the chances of such a coincidence happening were one in 17 trillion. <sighs> but then two statisticians at Harvard University calculated that with millions of people regularly buying lottery tickets in America, the odds of such an event happening to someone somewhere were only about one in 30. Not that amazing after all. <sighs> oh, that's oh, unbelievable. Yeah, that can't be right. Unit 16. The Human Mind. 16.2. Exercise 2. Recognition is one of the mind's most vital skills, and we use it daily in everything from the simplest to the most complex of tasks. And at the moment when we recognise something, electrical activity takes place inside our brains. Our faculty for recognition can break down, however. Someone suffering the brain disorder agnosia will look at an item, a cup perhaps, and have no idea what it is. Agnosia tends to be very specific. One sufferer may be unable to recognise faces, while another has difficulty with man-made objects. Such disorders can result from localised damage to a specific area in the brain, suggesting that we use different parts of it to store items of different kinds. This would explain the variation in the symptoms of agnosia. It appears, in fact, that the brain stores and categorises things not according to their appearance or function, but by our individual relationship with them. A musical instrument, such as a trombone, can be seen, felt, played or heard. Each quality of an item seems to be stored in a separate region of the brain, in what are sometimes called recognition units. So, a musical instrument would have several units. Its shape would be remembered in our visual areas, the word in our vocabulary area, touch in the touch area, and its sound in our hearing area. Someone who has never touched a trombone, though, wouldn't have a touch recognition unit. Each region of the brain may contain the recognition units of objects that seem very different, but they're together because they share the particular quality that concerns that region. So, our trombone might sit in the same bit of the brain as a drinking straw, or a pencil if we suck them, because they're all non-food items that we put in our mouths. When we think of a trombone, all of our separate trombone recognition units are drawn together from their separate storage regions and united to give us what we recognise as a trombone. So it seems that our own individual experiences create the geography of our brains, and that in turn affects our behaviour. Faces occupy a special category of our recognition faculties, and brain scans show heightened activity in these areas not only when we see faces, but even when we imagine seeing them. One reason is that humans are social animals. We live as we've always lived, in groups, and our survival depends on our ability to communicate with others of our own species. So we've evolved with special brain wiring for face recognition. Even a newborn baby will orientate itself towards objects that resemble faces, 
like a balloon with eyes, nose and mouth drawn on it. Why is it that we forget one person's face, yet remember another, even though neither face might be particularly striking? The recognition unit of a face stays active if we have seen or imagined that person frequently, but this doesn't necessarily require a strong stimulus. That person may stay in our memory if we often see someone else who resembles them. But if we neither see nor think about a person for a long time, the facial recognition unit we have for them falls into disuse, and we may not recognise them if we see them again. Our reactions to faces involve strong emotions. When we meet someone for the first time, we may decide, without any evidence, that they look trustworthy, perhaps, or threatening. This irrational response happens because when we see someone, we check whether or not we know them. And this activity uses two pathways within the brain, one conscious, the other unconscious. Through the latter, we can relive an emotional reaction we have had to someone who merely looks slightly like the person we are meeting for the first time. The conscious pathway works more slowly and enables us to work out, for instance, whose face we're looking at and how we should behave towards them. The unconscious pathway is faster and goes through one of the brain's centres of emotion. If we meet a person whose face slightly resembles someone we feared and hated in the past, for example, we briefly experience again our feelings towards that original figure. It's this emotional memory that gives us an almost instantaneous first impression of the person we're meeting. Progress Test 4. This test is in the teacher's book. You will hear part of a lecture about questions in the study of philosophy. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Every day we ask questions and rarely think about the ways in which they differ. But asking the wrong type of question can lead to misunderstanding in daily life and has caused many problems in philosophy. So let me start by talking about some different types of question. Consider the question, how big is your car? I might want to know how many passengers you can take, whether you can park in the space that's available, or how much fuel it uses. So, before you can answer adequately, you need to know my purpose in asking the question. In everyday life, we ask many factual questions about the world around us. For instance, why won't my computer start? And we can answer these questions from experience. Maybe the answer is, there's a power cut. It may be possible to answer factual questions in principle, but not in practice. If I ask, what's the population of Canada at this precise moment, it can be answered in principle. That is, there is a precise answer, but it's highly unlikely that anyone will ever know what it is. So the question can't be answered in practice. Questions may appear to be factual, but aren't. If you and I both know that Jenny Jones is 1 meter 75 tall, and I ask, is Jenny Jones tall? I'm asking whether the word tall is normally used in such a situation. In other words, this is a verbal question, not a factual one about Jenny's height. In some cases, verbal questions have serious consequences. Imagine that Billy Smith is on trial in a court of law, and both sides agree about the facts of what happened. The dispute is about how to answer the question, was Billy Smith's action legal? This isn't simply a question about the use of the word legal because it gives instructions. In effect, legal means 
set him free, and illegal might mean sent him to prison. Legality is decided according to certain criteria, but there's much less agreement over the criteria when deciding if something is right. If I ask, was Billy Smith's action right? One person may say yes and another no, and unless I know what criteria they're each using, their answers are of no value to me. Before you hear the next part of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I'll now mention some ways in which questions can reflect the speaker's assumptions, that is, beliefs that are taken as being true without thinking. The way a question is phrased can show that the questioner assumes something is true and expects others to agree. This is often the case with questions about someone's opinion, such as, don't you think that's a beautiful painting? A leading question like this makes it clear what answer is wanted. Sometimes, efforts to answer a question are wasted because the assumptions behind a question are false. For years, economists assumed that objects had a real value and attempted to define it. But they were wrong. Value is relative. It can mean how important the object is to different people, or the price the object will sell for, which will vary depending on the time and place. Economists were asking the wrong question. We often build into questions the false assumption that there's only one answer. What's the right way of doing this? But whether it's about bringing up children or playing chess, there can be many answers, and they're likely to be simply a matter of opinion. So the value of the answer depends on what you think of the person giving the answer. If we ask whether a country or a company is friendly, generous, or aggressive, it isn't at all clear what's meant by the country. Is it the present government, most inhabitants, or what? Or what's meant by the description, nor is it clear how it could be measured. We're making the very questionable assumption that personal qualities can be applied to groups of people in just the same way as they can be applied to individuals. Now I'll turn to another subject. Unit 17. Migration. 17.2. Exercise 2. Okay. The photo I'm showing you now is of a group of factory workers in Guelph. It was taken in 1933, when migrants were still coming over from Italy to Canada in search of work. Of course, this movement stopped altogether in 1939 uh, with the onset of war. In order to understand why Italians came to Canada, you need to understand why they left Italy. In the late 19th century, Italy was divided into three regions, the north, the south, and a central region which included the capital, Rome, and the Vatican. The recently industrialized north was much more prosperous than the rest of the country. This state of affairs was influenced by government policy, which encouraged northern growth at the expense of the agricultural south, where work was in very short supply, with consequent extreme poverty. This regional disparity led to animosity between Italians of the north and those in the south, and by the turn of the century, many Italian men from both the north and the south were leaving to seek seasonal employment elsewhere in Europe, uh, in South America, notably Argentina, and North America. They hoped to earn enough in a few months to enable them to return home, but this usually proved to be an impossible dream. In the very early days, most of the migrants who came to Canada worked outdoors in the summer, doing things like railroad construction. Many of them often traveled across the whole country in one season. In the winter, when this type of work wasn't available, migrants mostly went to urban centers like Toronto, where they picked up casual work, for instance, manual laboring. The first Italians came to Guelph in the early 1900s. The city at that time was a small, quiet town, 
and local businessmen felt frustrated by this, knowing that slow growth was limiting their own prosperity. They believed that Guelph's commercial growth uh, had to be more actively encouraged, specifically by promoting industry and uh, creating a large industrial working class. The city started to subsidize the development of factories, and land was made available to accommodate new enterprises. Guelph also became the new home for many established manufacturing firms, and by 1911, the population had doubled. Thousands of workers were taken on, many of whom were Italian migrants. Until this time, male migration had predominated. The men often boarded together and found jobs and accommodation for those who came after them. The men, who were not yet official immigrants, clung to their own culture. Eventually, many were able to send for their families or return to Italy to find a suitable bride. And in time, as the next generation of children was born in Canada, a new culture evolved, still based on Italian memories, but combined with the more immediate Canadian experience. The Italian-Canadian ethnic group, whose men and women had very different roles, established a stable and respectable community in the East End sector of Guelph. Today, it is still an active and thriving community, hosting an annual Italian festival in July. Test Folder 9 You will hear part of a lecture about animal migration. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Today I'm going to talk about animal migration, which is the seasonal or periodic movement of animals, including birds, fish and insects. This movement takes place in response to changes in climate or in the availability of food, or it can be to ensure reproduction. Migration most commonly, though not always, involves movement from one area to another and then back again. This is called round-trip or return migration, and it may be seasonal, as in the spring and autumn migrations of many species of birds. Whooper swans, for instance, nest and breed in sub-arctic habitats, and every autumn around 7,000 birds fly 800 kilometres from Iceland to Britain to spend the winter there. They reach a speed of over 90 kilometres an hour and in good weather conditions can reach Scotland in under 13 hours. With the arrival of spring, they return to Iceland. In some species, the migration may require a lifetime to complete. Like other species of Pacific salmon, sockeye salmon are born in freshwater streams, travel to ocean waters and then return to the stream where they were born. Here they breed before dying. Unlike some Atlantic salmon, which may repeat the cycle several times, Pacific salmon make the round trip only once. Migration occurs in a wide range of animals, from microorganisms in freshwater lakes, which shift seasonally from deep to shallow water as a result of temperature changes, to whales. Grey whales make a round trip of 20,000 kilometres each year, they have their young in the warm, shallow lagoons off the Pacific coast of Mexico. Then, in the late spring, they travel north along the coast of North America to the Arctic, where they feed during the summer. They return south in the autumn. European freshwater eels are thought to breed in the Sargasso Sea, a calm area of the Atlantic Ocean, north of the West Indies and east of Florida and Bermuda. The young eels are slowly carried eastwards by the Gulf Stream and various physiological changes occur which will enable the eels to live in freshwater rivers and lakes in Europe. After a number of years they return to the Sargasso Sea to produce the next generation, 
and the parent eels then die. In addition to round-trip migration, some migrations are nomadic in nature. This is where movement is irregular and depends on temporary local conditions. For example, ostriches, the large flightless birds that live on the plains of Central and Eastern Africa, move in response to varying local conditions of food and climate. In these migrations, the animals follow no regular route and don't return to any one place. Migratory locusts of Africa and Asia exhibit one-way migration to new sites. When their populations peak and food becomes scarce, enormous masses of locusts move to new areas, almost blackening the sky as they pass overhead. Migration based on the availability of food is often dictated by seasonal climate change. As the cold settles in, North American red-tailed hawks, for instance, can no longer find the small rodents and birds that they normally eat. This scarcity prompts the birds to fly south to warmer areas like Mexico to find a more abundant food source, and they follow this pattern each year. Plant-eating mammals, such as antelopes, typically graze in herds, which can quickly eat all the grass in an area. In the summer, the grass regrows quickly, but in winter it doesn't, forcing these herds to travel to find fresh food supplies. When spring brings new growth, the herds move back to the areas where they found food the previous summer. Great grey owls are birds whose migration is very variable, perhaps occurring one year and then not again for several years. The number of individuals taking part also fluctuates enormously. Unit 18. The study of literature. 18.2. Exercise 2. Right, sit down both of you. Now, Anna, you've prepared some questions for us to discuss today, haven't you? Yes, I've been considering how literary translation should be approached. Ah, yes, a very interesting area. Gary, could I just check whether this fits in with your current research? Yeah, definitely. Funnily enough, I've been reading the French writer Emile Zola in translation recently. Good. Right. Well, my first question relates to the translator. Should a novel's translator have the original or the target language as their mother tongue? And that's a good place to start. So, what's your view, Anna? I should start by saying the obvious, that every translator needs to have a very good knowledge of the foreign language they're translating to or from. It's not enough to rely on even the largest of dictionaries, because they don't always help with literary nuance. For me, it's preferable for the translator to be a native speaker of the N translations language, because then I think that work will read more naturally in its own right. I take your point, Anna. But isn't there then a risk of the translator missing or misunderstanding something crucial in the source text? I think that's always a danger with translations, whatever the nationality of the translator. There are good and bad translations after all. Exactly. Uh, another question I wanted to raise is this. Do novelists make better translators of fiction than other people? That's another great question. Uh, can you clarify why you're interested in this? Have you read any novels translated by other writers? Yes. I was thinking of one particular series published in Italy, actually, which includes Calvino's translation of the French writer Keno. The Argentinian writer Borges is translated in the same series. OK, so based on this reading, how would you answer your question? On the evidence of those titles, I'd say yes. Writers have a real edge on other translators. In the one done by Calvino, for example, there seemed to be much more attention to the original writer's style, plus a genuine attempt to recreate it in the new language. And that's important, surely, but many translators seem to have a rather different agenda in that they are trying above all to represent the content faithfully. Gary, do you have anything to add here? Or another question to air, perhaps? Well... To the best of my knowledge, I've never read a translation prepared by another author, so I can't really comment. Although it does seem logical for one writer to be able to translate the work of another more sympathetically. Moving on. 
In relation to the 19th century writing of Zola, where lots of translations of the same titles exist, I know there is a lot of debate in terms of how the speech of that time has been rendered in translation. Many of Zola's books featured Parisian slang of the period in a radical new way, and it appears that that is difficult to capture. Impossible. I know that an English translation of one of his books resorted to London Cockney slang, <laughs> which caused quite a storm on publication. But that has a totally false ring coming from the mouths of French characters, and it also seems rather dated nowadays. But that's going to be a problem with any translation, isn't it? I mean, language changes all the time. So, should you translate a 1950s novel into the language of today, or is that a crime in itself because it takes the work out of its historical context? Literary translation is one big can of worms. <laughs> I can say to you now that I have no intention of becoming a translator myself ever. However, and this is my final question, isn't a compromised text better than having no text in translation at all? We can't learn every single language, so we will always need translations, or be restricted to the literature written in our own language, which seems a very narrow way of approaching the subject to me. Well done, both of you. Now, can you write up some of your ideas on this for me by next Wednesday? I'd uh, like to go. Eighteen point two. Exercise four. Writers have a real edge on other translators. Many translators seem to have a rather different agenda. I know that an English translation of one of his books resorted to London Cockney slang, which caused quite a storm on publication. But that has a totally false ring coming from the mouths of French characters. Literary translation is one big can of worms. Unit nineteen, earning a living. Nineteen point one, exercise two. Questions one to seven. As a way of earning a living, running your own business has two distinctive features. The first is that you don't go through the usual selection procedure. You're not competing against other applicants, or facing psychological tests, or、uh, cunning interview questions to test your suitability for the job. You're the sole judge of your fitness to start and run your own business. This puts a very heavy responsibility on your self-knowledge, because not everyone is suited to this type of work. You can also learn about yourself from the opinion of colleagues, friends, or family. But this carries the risk of emotional problems. They may feel under pressure to give a favourable opinion for fear of offending you. Unless you can expect an objective view, it's better not to ask them at all. The second unusual characteristic of setting up on your own is that you decide what type of business it is and who you'll be selling to. If your business is well run, it stands a good chance of succeeding. In practice, however, You can make success more likely by selecting your product and market carefully. Although you may be able to create a demand for what you have to sell, it's much easier if that demand already exists. While many people dream of、uh, setting up their own business, not so many actually do so.、Uh, some, of course, are entrepreneurs from the start, starting a business without ever working for another organisation. Others. Who have been employed are sometimes pushed into making the change by external circumstances, such as、uh, being sacked or made redundant. They may have been thinking about becoming self-employed for years, but been too comfortable to do anything about it. It also often happens that someone is confident of being appointed to a more senior position within their organisation, and another person is chosen instead. This can have a very demoralising effect. And even destroy the satisfaction the person gained from their work. A third reason is when someone begins to feel that they've got nothing to show for the years they've been working. This may be triggered by reaching a particular age, such as forty, or by seeing friends or colleagues as being more successful. Questions eight to fourteen.
When you're considering whether or not to start your own business, you need to make a realistic assessment of what it involves, particularly while you're getting established. Your business life is unlikely to be easy. At the outset, and perhaps for some time, you may find you can't draw as much income from your business as you'd like. It can be very helpful if your husband or wife is earning so that they can provide the funds you need to live on. While you might think you can choose when to work, in practice you'll probably find you have far longer working hours than you'd like. This is almost unavoidable. If your business isn't going well, you'll have problems to overcome, and even if it's successful, you may want to make as much money as possible in case things start going wrong. Running your own business can lead to a great deal of stress, particularly if you allow the business to overwhelm you. Talk to your family about your work and ask for their support so that you're not facing the problems alone. You'll need to be a salesperson, technical expert, accountant and administrator all in one. Be honest about your skills. If you can identify your weaknesses, consider being trained or try to afford expert assistance. Failure is very likely if you take a major gamble, but if you only want to pursue low-risk ventures, you may be short of ideas to follow up. The best chance of success comes from calculated risks which allow you to make a sound estimate of the likely outcome. Founding and controlling a successful business can yield a tremendous sense of achievement, but there may be failures. If there are, you must be able to accept failure without finding the effect devastating and improve your future performance by drawing all the lessons possible from your mistakes, if indeed you've made any. You're probably wondering whether it's such a good idea to start your own business, but now I'll go on to some of the rewards. 19.1 Exercise 5 1. A. Many people would love to be their own boss, but have too many financial commitments to take the risk. 1. B. Many people would love to be their own boss, but have too many financial commitments to take the risk. 2. A. This at least is the conventional idea, although many people like this never start a business. 2. B. This at least is the conventional idea, although many people like this never start a business. 3. A. Another factor that can cause problems when you start to employ other people is the desire for power. 3. B. Another factor that can cause problems when you start to employ other people is the desire for power. 4. A. Don't try to control your staff so much that they can't work effectively. 4. B. Don't try to control your staff so much that they can't work effectively. 19.1. Exercise 6. When I was 14, I got a job delivering newspapers to people's homes. I had to arrive at the paper shop at uh, 6 o'clock every morning, take the newspapers from around and uh, cycle off and deliver them. And I needed to be at school before 9. Uh, I'd applied for the job because I wanted to earn some money. I hadn't thought much about what was involved, but I was sure there'd be nothing to it. But I was wrong. <laughs> in most homes, the newspaper had to be pushed through the letterbox in the front door. And it was sometimes a struggle to find the right front door. Um, a lot of them weren't numbered... Uh, some letterboxes were at ground level or not in the door at all. And several were so small it took ages to get the newspapers through. Oh, and there was another problem. Dogs jumping up at the letterbox and trying to bite my fingers. 
I just about managed to get to school on time, but I was so exhausted that I almost fell asleep during a maths lesson. I decided not to go back the next morning, but then I thought of the money I could earn, so I changed my mind. <laughs> Luckily, it was much easier from then on. Test folder 10. You will hear a careers advisor talking to a group of students about applying for jobs. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 9. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 9. Now I know that many of you are applying for jobs at the moment, so here's some advice on maximising your chances of success. If you've been invited to a job interview, particularly if it's your first, you're probably delighted that you've got that far. But you may be wondering how recruiters make their choice. They want to appoint the best person for the job. But how do they decide? Sometimes it's difficult to know exactly what they're looking for in an ideal candidate. So let me tell you what generally impresses interviewers. One important area is personal initiative. This covers a range of skills, competencies and qualities and includes things like being a self-starter. That is, not waiting to be told everything, but making an effort to find out for yourself asking questions, doing tasks that need to be done and which are within your capabilities. Initiative also involves showing a potential employer that you've identified your professional goals and have worked out how to achieve them, both the training and the hands-on experience that you want within the organisation. Most recruiters will be uneasy if you've applied for jobs as varied as an accountant, a teacher and a sales executive. They'll suspect that you lack the necessary focus and they won't expect you to be interested enough in the work or determined enough to succeed. Recruiters generally want someone who won't give up. In most jobs these days, people are working under pressure and you need to be able to handle it. As the saying goes, if you can't stand the heat... Get out of the kitchen. Recruiters are normally interested in someone who's enthusiastic about getting involved, so you should show that you welcome a challenge. They also look for confident individuals who are adaptable and flexible. The ability to project the right image is a must-have skill for most employers. This means always behaving in a professional way and having respect for people, whether these are colleagues, customers or suppliers. And this needs to be maintained even in difficult situations. And always make sure you promote a positive image both of yourself and of the organisation. If applicants haven't bothered to find out before the interview about the organisation they're applying to, it suggests that they aren't really interested in working there. So it pays to do some research. Then in the interview itself, you can ask questions that both impress the recruiters and give you the information you need. Job applicants very often undersell what they're capable of doing, and this may be because they've failed to review their experience so far. It's a worthwhile exercise to compile a list of your skills and how you developed them. Then, when you get to an interview, you'll have plenty of examples to refer to. You may be the perfect candidate, but you need to let others know about it. It's really important that one of your strengths is communication, you need to be able to put your point across in a discussion, take on board what other people are saying and respond appropriately. Being at ease and able to chat with others on an everyday level is a valuable aspect of this too. I hope this is making you think about how to prepare for an interview and also how to behave once... Unit 20. It's history. 20.2. Exercise 2. Questions 1 to 7. Today in our survey of the social history of Britain, 
We're going to be looking at the seaside holiday, and I'll start with a brief overview. Nowhere in the country is more than about 150 kilometers from the sea, but for centuries the sea was the preserve of shipping. It wasn't associated with leisure, even for those people who could afford to travel for pleasure. Britain's annual seaside ritual began in the 18th century, with the new aristocratic fashion for sea bathing. Hardly anyone could swim in those days, and the main attraction of the seaside was the benefits of sea water and sea air for the health. Submersion in the ice-cold waves, followed by a glass of seawater mixed with milk or honey, was thought to cure all illnesses, so the aristocracy came in the winter. This fashion was soon followed by other people with money. In the mid-19th century, seaside resorts expanded rapidly as railways were constructed, connecting industrial towns with the coast. Far more people were now able to travel to the seaside, and sleepy coastal villages were transformed into booming seaside towns. They were no longer primarily regarded as health resorts, but as entertainment centres, and people generally went there in the summer. The holidaymakers were mostly middle class, as they were the only people who could afford the expensive train fares and seaside accommodation. But by the end of the 19th century, working class families were also flocking to the coast from the industrial towns and cities. 19th century seaside resorts attracted distinct social classes, and their reputation as either upmarket or downmarket became part of the national folklore, continuing into the 20th century and even to some extent today. Resorts that catered for the mass market laid on popular entertainments and provided inexpensive accommodation to entice people to stay longer, as many working class families could only afford day trips to the seaside. In the 1920s and 30s, seaside holidays boomed as never before, as doctors began to stress the importance of fresh air, exercise and sunlight. This was because the poor state of the nation's health had become a major concern. Questions 8 to 14 From the late 19th century onwards, more and more workers had time off work with pay. But the trend was given new impetus in 1948 when Parliament passed an act guaranteeing paid holidays. Soon, two-thirds of manual workers were having a fortnight off each year and the majority of working-class families had enough money to stay away for a week or two. Most chose to go to the same resort that they had previously visited on their day trips, usually the closest to where they lived. In fact, many returned year after year to the same accommodation. Group holidays involving extended families, streets or even whole towns were still the norm. Entire communities went on holiday together, especially when the major employers in northern industrial towns closed down for a week or two in the summer. The success story of British seaside resorts ended in the 1960s. One factor was the new jet aircraft, which brought travel to Spain or the Greek islands within reach of far more people. Then, too, the ever-expanding international tourist industry organised flights and accommodation covered by a single, fairly low payment. This was the birth of the package holiday. Sunshine replaced the sea as the main holiday attraction, and an annual foreign holiday with a suntan to prove it was now taken for granted as part of modern life. With the even greater affluence of the last few years, it's no longer unusual to take two or more holidays a year. Maybe a long-haul flight to Thailand, Australia or the USA, plus a winter skiing holiday in Bulgaria, Andorra or Canada. And in between there may well be weekend breaks abroad, as the growth of low-cost airlines has meant that a flight to Spain or Italy can be cheaper than a much shorter train journey within Britain. Another change is that instead of the large groups of the past, the trend is for families to holiday by themselves. Many older teenage children and young people go on independent holidays with friends rather than their relations. And another trend is for school leavers not to go straight on to higher education, but to take what's called a gap year first, spending time in Australia perhaps, or travelling round the world. It's all a far cry from the seaside holidays in Britain of the past. 
Now, let's go on to another thing that developed in the... 20.2. Exercise 7. Pattern 1. Extreme. Right. Since. Presume. June. Pattern 2. Replaced. Closest. Icy. Written. Cuter. Pattern 3. Spacious. Fashion. Region. Conclusive. Global. Progress test 5. This test is in the teacher's book. You will hear a student describing a book she has just read. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. OK, now the book I've chosen to tell you about is The Cambridge Companion to Australian Literature. It's an introduction to the subject and was published in 2000. The book was edited by Elizabeth Webby, who's Professor of Australian Literature at the University of Sydney, and each chapter is by a well-known scholar or critic working in different literary fields in Australia. So the people who wrote it knew what they were talking about. Um, this book begins briefly itemising what's happened in Australia in the past two centuries, including its literature. I found this very useful because I'm afraid my knowledge of Australian history is pretty limited. Each chapter of the book deals with a different genre or literary movement rather than different historical periods, although within each chapter the subject is dealt with from a historical perspective. The writers look at literature within its historical, social and cultural contexts, I suppose showing what makes it distinctly Australian, I think their aim is to introduce the subject to the interested reader from outside the country. And although an expert in the subject might find it interesting, it's probably more for someone like me who isn't a specialist. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. The chapter on contemporary fiction starts from the late 1960s and examines the radical changes that took place around that time in the cultural atmosphere of the country. Previously, Australia had been perceived as a single culture, but with a change in government policy in 1974, many people began to emigrate to Australia from Southeast Asia. This increased the country's diversity a lot, and the society was now transformed into a multicultural one. In 1973, the Federal Government's Literature Board started to award grants to individual writers, publishers and literary magazines – and this gave a big boost to all sorts of literary activity and encouraged people to write who previously hadn't had the chance, particularly people from minority ethnic groups. There were several social factors behind these changes in the 70s, including improvements in global communication and the fact that travel soon became much easier and more affordable. Australia was no longer seen as an isolated continent far away from the cultural influences of the rest of the world. 
The section on the theatre shows that changes here have been even more dramatic than in prose writing. Financial support from federal and state governments meant that writers, actors, and directors could do far more than before. New theatre companies sprang up around the country, and actors and writers had much more scope to experiment in their work. Poetry, like drama, also participated in the cultural debate, partly because Australia took part in the Vietnam War in the 1960s. The writer of this chapter points out that it wasn't only the young revolutionary poets, but also established ones who spoke out against Australia's involvement in Vietnam. The final chapter. Describes the way that literary criticism has changed over the years in both universities and literary magazines. One thing that I found particularly interesting was the way that literature and literary criticism are affected by different moods in the country. In the early part of the twentieth century, there was a nationalist approach to literature, which eventually gave way to modern and postmodern literature and literary criticism. Well, that's a brief outline of what the book contains, and now I'll move on to.